public inquiry into the deaths of Aboriginal women what was resisting, but the provinces are looking to turn up the pressure for a public inquiry. The world inquiry. had stopped making sense. And I was feeling lost too, you know, and full of anger and disappointment. So I just wanted to be alone in nature for a while. And I set out to make a documentary on the longest trail in the world. 500 days in the wild turned out to be a lot more than that. I mean, I'll leave it as a surprise for viewers, but what an extraordinary experience the film is. And part of that is because, number one, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could sleep in a tent, mostly alone, in the woods, all across Canada for six years. <laughs> that, to me, is your greatest achievement. <laughs> oh, thank you. Ben. Thank you. But seriously, how did you deal with the fear initially? Well, you know, and I always like to say there's many different types of fear. There's physical fear, there's emotional fear, there's a psychological fear. And absolutely, right from day one, the first and obvious fear is I'm a woman, I'm alone, and I'm sleeping alone in a tent, which does not have a lock on the door. So that was the first fear I had to overcome. And all I can say was, you know, it took a while, um, but as the days go by and nothing happens, the fear starts to subside because fear needs to be fed, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, basically in order to sustain itself. And when what you confront instead of the big scary things are, in fact, when you do meet people, they're extremely kind. When you do see wildlife they're just as curious about me as I am about them. And um, so days went by and then years went by and that fear subsided. Wow, incredible. Uh, but I mean, the very first night, were you sort of crying or? <laughs> well, not because of the fear. It was the, the uh, realization that uh, the last time I had done, you know, a journey like this was a long time ago. Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of on the job training. <laughs> so I was more about like, oh, my God, I can't stand like I am so sore right now. I am lying on my back and I can't even get up. I'm crawling out of my tent. So, I mean, just the very, you know, it was, it was the breaking in was quite uh, intense, I guess, for lack of a better way of expressing it. But again, you know, um, just one day at a time, like everything in life, right? Any large mountain, you just have to tackle it one day at a time, one step at a time. It. Ain't it the truth? Now, all right, you occasionally you had people there to, sh to shoot with you. You had your own four or five cameras. That's right. And occasional drones. Fantastic footage. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank but you. It, it makes it the sum total of what you collected and how you collected it is that it, the film feels very visceral mm. and so we're right there and that is magic i think that's one of the leading you know wonderful things about the film um and of course you would have no idea what it would look like during so you were just kind of hoping and praying that it would turn out or were you pretty confident no. <laughs> I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that. I mean, for me, filmmaking is not unlike making a sculpture. We gather the clay and then you get into the edit room and you're like, now I'm going to sculpt a horse. And by the time it's done, you're like, oh, it's a unicorn. So <laughs> surprises for sure. But what I can say is if you follow your heart, when you're following your eye, you're following the things that make you feel. And you have to trust that it's going to let, if it lands on you, it's going to land on someone else as well. And this is how I make my films. I'm a cinema verite filmmaker. I usually observe people, but you know, as you know, I've been to Mount Everest, I've been to the high Arctic. These are the kind of films that I like to make. The difference being usually I'm following the people that are trained for these things. And this time I am the subject of my own film and clearly not an extreme athlete in any way, shape or form. Um, but yeah, <laughs> well, you know, you said that right off the top that you're not an extreme athlete, but mentally you are. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, um, I'm a woman like yourself. And so, you know, we have to overcome a lot of obstacles sometimes in our life. Mm -hmm. And I think that once you, you know, right from the age of five, you know, I wanted to be a professional hockey player in 1970. And of course there were no women only now are we getting a professional hockey team for women. And so when you have to confront these things in your life, it's like muscle building, right? You get stronger and stronger and stronger. And you're like, I can, I can do these things. You know, I just be patient, be gentle. And like you saw, I mean, 
you know, when it was rough weather, I sat on shore. I was very cautious. I respected my boundaries and I respected nature a lot. And um, well, speaking of respecting nature, I actually have a phobia about Lake Superior. I was on the shores once, but from what people have told me who live there, I'm terrified of it. And I saw a graphic about how deep it is. Mm. And there you were having these traumatic experiences, waiting for storms, forest fires, and knowing the depth and, and everything that lies below Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. Were you prepared for the, for the feelings that you had there? No, I really wasn't. Anne. And I must say, right from the very beginning, when I looked at the map of the Trans-Canada Trail uh, to, you know, for 500 days, I was right off the back. Well, whoa, but we'll just deal with that when we get there. Um, and fortunately, I had by that point of time done, you know, it's 8000 kilometers of paddling on this journey. And by that point, I had done a little bit. I, you know, so I had some experience my first, you know, um, and then it turned out to be the most profound, one of the most profound parts of the entire journey. And a lot of that had to do with um, just my profound connection to the to some of the people that I met along the way. I spent time um, with the Anishinaabe in ceremony and I think um, gathered the wisdom that I needed to be safe out there, which was really, you know, connecting with the water instead of the sense of being on it. So yeah. whenever I got afraid, I would just be like, the water is sacred, the water is sacred, like yes. really connect with the water and then it the, it really did help eliminate some of the fear instead of being this adversary or this trying to conquer something you are with something and that was a shift in me there was a lot of shifts over the last six, over those 6 years but yes. that was a profound one it's one thing to be told the words it's another thing for them to actually land and actually shift the way you experience something and i did there and i'm very grateful like I said, I really believe it was my time with the Anishinaabe people uh, that prepared me for that. There is this wonderful moment. Uh, you're always on the move, pretty much, unless you're you're stuck by weather or, or conditions, whatever. Uh, you are with the wild horses. Mm -hmm. And I oh. haven't seen visuals of people being approached and being with them before. That must have been absolutely chillingly wonderful. Yeah, it really was. I mean, that was in Saskatchewan. And by that point, I'm in year four of the journey. So a lot of changes happened in me at that point. And, um, you know, it was, again, I what I learned out there was so much of this is about resonance. It's what it's the energy that we put out. And as you saw, you know, I walk out into that field, I get down on my knees and I pick some wild sage and I just bow my head and offer it to these wild horses. And within a few minutes, they started to respond. And I really believe that they could feel my energy. Horses can, you know, people go to them for healing uh, because they can sort of see through your BS. <laughs> they know what you're, you know, if you project something that isn't in alignment with the energy that they're getting from you, they know it and they will not trust you. So um, they're kind of a mirror to your soul. <laughs> there's another wonderful, there's so many wonderful moments, but you're at the lake, in the lake, I forget actually if you're on the beach or on the lake, but somebody comes by in a boat, as two strangers offering oh, you meat. That was on the 4,000 kilometer paddle up to the Arctic Ocean, uh, which was um, by far the longest paddle and uh, the most intense. And uh, yeah, but that point I had was up at the Mackenzie River, only about a thousand kilometers from the Arctic Ocean, quite a, you know in the middle of nowhere. And yeah, um, I was paddling with um, my now partner Louisa. And yeah, off uh, out of nowhere come these two hunters, and of course, uh, well, we were we immediately we accepted the meat, and we immediately landed the boat and cooked it all up because, of course, <laughs> we were also very concerned about bears. So here's this wonderful gift of this bag of fresh caribou meat, but then <laughs> we've got this bag of meat in our canoe, and we've been so afraid of bears. So we pulled over and we literally cooked it up and we ate it all right out of the pan, like. Children in a candy store. Yeah, it was <laughs> oh, fun. that's hilarious. Just out of curiosity, if you were to put like load the bag and ballast it down with something underwater, would they find it? Uh, good question. You know, I never did that. And so, uh, I mean, they have a very good sense of smell. Like, yeah, probably not. Are, probably would But yeah. uh, certainly that a lot of people do do that. 
Now, you talk about the changes and transformations that you went through on it. At the beginning of the journey, you were, you just had to get the hell away. Yeah. I, yeah. Get into nature. Yeah. I need to take a break. Yeah. I need, I'd like to say to people, it was time to check out, to check in, you know, Yeah. and I'm a filmmaker and I needed a new project. I mean, as an indie filmmaker, you know, you just kind of throw yourself into things. So uh, it just met all the criteria. It seemed like a really good idea. (laughs) Well, I mean, and it, and it was on many, many levels that I can think of anyway. Uh Um, But at the end of the journey, you are a completely different person. Yeah. That was stunning. Oh, I can see how it happened. I mean, it, you know, gradually it, you, you, you see that there's not a lot to be scared about that. People are generally good and kind yeah. as opposed to the way we think they are. Well, and, I mean, you know, the news, you watch the news, you think the world's full of so- psychopaths, yeah. and, but it's not, uh, you know, if it bleeds, it leads in the news and no hard feelings. I mean, we do need to know about the things that we need to be concerned about. So they have a job to do, yeah. but It is important to sort of take a breather sometimes and just remember that 99.9% of the world are kind people. And that's something I needed to be reminded about. That's something I forgot about too. You know, when I went, I went out there to be alone. And of course, what turns out is that the whole film is about connection. It's about connection to self, (laughs) land, connection to community, connection to water. So yeah, it's all about connection. And I think one of the big things too that happens in the middle is this realization of like, you know, in, a, in one of the scenes about individuality, something I had really obviously romanticized, as do a lot of other people who go off on these adventures. And yet, you know, uh, something I romanticized, I changed my, you know, over those years, all of a sudden it was like, no, that's actually something that's very dysfunctional. And it's actually a sickness in our culture. You know, we uh, need each other. Yeah. You should write, a. I mean, I'm sure everyone's told you this, but you should really write a a detailed book not only oh, it's coming. Of your life. yay oh, good. it's so and coming i've already been writing it for like over a year oh, uh, we're good at- and I have a great literary agent and uh, he's been very patient because, of course, we did the film first. But um, I've written books on all my other documentaries. Uh, my documentary up in the high Arctic that I did with the NFB, This Land, I, made, I wrote a book called This Vanishing Land. So 500 Days in the Wild will definitely be followed up with a book. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that because I, I want to know more. You told us so many interesting things in the film. And oh. I just want to make sure that I absorb them all. Um like and like you said the cult of the individual that's been celebrated all this time and I agree with you that it's maybe not Mm -hmm. what we need to strive towards so and I'm sure you have many more bombos for us so I (laughs) I very much look forward to that um have you started watching news again Uh, yes I have I I do you know I I like to read the news but I limit myself and I also make sure that I take a long walk and sit with an old tree every day too whenever possible even if I'm hiking around trying to find those trees to sit with and just ground out and just remember that we really are all as one you know one of the things I remember too is looking out in the forest one day and realizing on the surface, every tree looks like it stands alone, but beneath the surface, they're all connected by their roots. And guess what? So too are we. So that's the big takeaway here. I'm a, you know, we are all one. Oh my God. What a great interview. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Anne. Pleasure and was mine. Maybe I'll get to interview you again when your book comes out. Sure. Yeah. That sounds great. Good stuff. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, and Take care. Mind if I lie here with you a while? Totally bagged. That's all good. I chose this. This journey is about reconnecting and uh, saying thank you to the ancestors of this land. So thank you. Bye. Bye. As they say, it's the journey, not the destination.